I think we're going to get started with the second panel. Uh, I'll just introduce myself briefly, since a lot of you may not know me. I'm Julia Galef. I'm a writer and a speaker in New York. I'm on the board of directors with the New York City Skeptics, and I co-host their official podcast, Rationally Speaking, with a professor of philosophy of science, Massimo Pellucci, and I also co-blog for him at rationallyspeaking.org. And I'm very happy to be here at my first Skepticon. Thank you. So the topic of the second panel was touched on briefly in the previous panel, but we're going to go into it in a lot more depth now. It's, does skepticism lead to atheism? And before we get started, I just wanted to take a minute to say that based on my experience with these types of discussions, both participating in them and, and observing them, I suspect it's, it's going to be pretty important for us to be really clear about what we mean when we use all of these words. Uh, which is a, a good general principle, but especially for the question of does skepticism lead to atheism, uh, I, can, I can think of multiple very different meanings of skepticism, of atheism, of lead to. Uh, essentially, the only non-problematic part of our panel topic is the word does, and, and I'm not even 100% sure about that. I'm going to keep my eye on that word. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to get that out there as a, uh, just a reminder to our panelists to be very clear, uh, for example, if you're uh, making an argument about God, are you talking about the God of the Bible? Are you talking about a deistic God that uh, doesn't interfere in our universe in any observable way? So I think in that vein, the best way to start out is by making sure that we're all on the same page and understanding each other when we talk about what we mean by skepticism. Uh, because uh, in my experience, some people interpret skepticism broadly as being essentially synonymous with rationality and critical thinking. And uh, other people interpret it more specifically as a method of testing empirical claims scientifically. And for other people, I think it actually is more of a worldview that uh, it's a philosophical position that rationality and that this scientific method are the best ways to get at truth. And so I, I suspect that a lot in this discussion might hinge on how we're defining skepticism as well as the other terms. So, so that's the first question I'd like to throw to all of our panelists, how you understand the word skepticism. So uh, Pizzi, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Oh boy, okay. Uh, well, let's see. I, I, I see skepticism as at root. Um, that critical thinking part where what you will do is examine claims and review them using the tools of science, of rational thought, uh, of an expectation of evidence, uh, by evaluation of sources, a whole bunch of tools that we very commonly use, uh, and that anytime you apply that to a question, you're, you're being a skeptic. So I think for many in, in this room, and this isn't meant as an insult, but this is just my experience with a lot of our folks at pub gatherings and other you know, skeptic get-togethers. For many of us, skeptic just means to doubt and to, to doubt someone else's claim, generally. We use it as a weapon when we're presented with something we think is nonsense. But uh, I'm with PZ on this one. I think a more useful definition of skepticism, rather than to doubts some claim, it is instead a method of inquiry, a way of looking into a claim one way or the other. It's not beginning with doubt in the positive sense, but it's kind of an open-minded inquiry into a claim, whatever that claim is. Uh, as, as such, uh, there's the implication that it's broadly applied, and it doesn't just have one simple domain, but really uh, skepticism has no uh, limits. Uh, all questions are within its purview. No issues are taboo or off topic. I think that's an, another important element of uh, the definition of skepticism. Randy. Well, uh, I'm not a scientist, as I'm sure you know. I've never claimed to be a scientist, but I try to think like one if I possibly can. My next book, which will be called 
a magician in the laboratory, will give you some rather succinct opinions of mine on some of the scientists, and I use that word in quotations frequently, uh, that I've come upon around the world have behaved themselves and misbehaved themselves. But in my opinion, my admittedly amateur opinion, I think that a scientist must be a skeptic if skepticism means doubting statements not supported by evidence. And for that very reason, I don't understand how a true scientist cannot be an atheist, except through fear, perhaps, fear of retribution or failing to go to Valhalla or wherever they might believe they, they would go. But I find that very difficult to understand how a really true, dedicated scientist cannot be an atheist. That is why I'm still puzzled over my late friend, very, very good friend, who I knew for 65 years, believe it or not, Martin Gardner, claimed to be a deist. And uh, we never discussed it in great detail, but as DJ told you earlier, uh, he, he did it because it brought him, and he said it in so many words, he, it brought him a certain amount of comfort. And if it gave comfort to my good friend, Martin Gardner, I'm all for it. Like if, you, if you'd introduce yourself briefly, just in case anyone. What's it? Would you uh, just introduce yourself briefly in case? I'm sorry, it's still in here. Ha, ha, uh, if you would mind uh, introducing yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm Vic Stanger. Uh, I've known James Randi for maybe 30 or 40 years. We were, we were sued once together by Yuri Geller, so <laughs> that's. And we won. That's one of. One of my proud lifetime achievements. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, uh, since the, since uh, a lot, everything has pretty much been said already. I just would like to point out one one fact, and that is there are a lot of people who call themselves skeptics, who uh, would be skeptics by the definition of doubting everything, but would not be skeptics, I think, by DJ's definition of, of carrying on and, and, and with the scientific method. And, and those are people, for example, who call themselves 9-11 skeptics or Holocausts, Holocaust skeptics, the uh, global warming skeptics in particular. Now, the global warming skeptics really think they are talking or claim they are talking about the evidence. Uh, and you have to look very careful uh, at them. And, and you find that that's not their motivation. Their motivation isn't the truth. Their motivation is to promote an agenda. And that's what uh, we have to uh, we have to guard against uh, with the word skepticism. We really have to go more than just skepticism. We have to go into into the whole scientific method and the treatment of data and and the uh, and the devil's advocate process as part of that. Every scientist uh, knows that. Even religious scientists uh, uh, do that on Monday when they on Sunday they leave their their science at the church door when they go into church. Uh, but then on Monday morning, they, they're back uh, doing science and using the, using the devil's advocate method on, on, on one another. So, so let's just keep that uh, in mind that it's more than just doubt, I guess. So am I correct in hearing from all of you that none of you would limit the scope of skepticism to claims that can be empirically tested? Is that correct? On that point, and actually to rejoin to something um, Vic said, uh, it's important that, number one, we see skepticism as a method, not as a doctrinaire set of beliefs that you already have. Skepticism is not a statement of non-beliefs, mm -hmm. right? If you go to a skeptic pub gathering, you shouldn't have to sign a list of things that you promise you don't believe in in order to belong right, or in order to be part of the mix. So it's a method, it's not, uh, uh, it's a process, it's not just a statement of things you don't believe in. Um, on, on the second point, the scope of skepticism, I think organizations have historically limited their operations looking into only those kinds of claims that could be empirically tested. So PSYCOP has historically said, we'll only look at religious claims when we can uh, test it in the laboratory or in the field, or Joe Nickel uh, uh, historically has, has gone and looked at a lot of religious claims, but in the field with his tools and his uh, 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 kind of method of inquiry. 
But because organizations have historically had that scope, I do not think it follows that skepticism as a method of inquiry should have that scope. I believe it's not only a perfectly legitimate reason to be skeptical of a claim because of bad evidence, but also because there's no evidence. Um, and you know, some versions of God, you can't prove one way or the other. You can't test uh, some of those claims empirically, yet I think it's perfectly legitimate for a skeptic to say, therefore, I lack belief in that claim because there just ain't no evidence for it. Right, so uh, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry that uh, you mentioned does limit the scope of skepticism to empirically testable claims. And my sense from reading their material is that this is not a tactical decision on their part, at least that's what they claim, that it's, it's really a, a principle um, that claims that can't be tested uh, are just outside of the domain of, of skeptical inquiry, uh, setting aside the organization's goals. Is yeah, that accurate? I, I, I think that's inaccurate, actually. Okay. Um, th there were varied opinions in the history, the 30-year history of PSYCOP or mm -hmm. the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Um, and at the JREF also, we limit our scope operationally to those kinds of claims that can be tested. Um, but in the history of organized skepticism, or let's put it this way, organizations that do skepticism, mm -hmm. uh, it was frankly just a matter of division of labor. Mm -hmm. So there are organizations that apply skepticism to the God claim, and those are called atheist organizations, uh, or the Council for Secular Humanism, or uh, you know, I mentioned American Atheists or others. And PSYCOP, because I, I was speaking with Paul Kurtz this summer about this uh, as one of the founders of uh, PSYCOP. He said, look, it was a matter of division of labor. It isn't that religion and the God claim is off limits to skepticism, but that PSYCOP is choosing not to focus on it because there are other organizations doing that and nonprofits function best when you have limited and clear missions and don't try to do everything uh, for everyone, and in fact, that is the JREF's position. The JREF is not an atheist organization in any sense. Well, I guess, except in the sense that so many of us are atheists, but that's like saying the U.S. is a Christian nation because so many citizens are Christian. It doesn't follow that we're actually an atheist organization just because we're atheists. We don't push atheism. We push skepticism of claims that you can test um, and not just faith claims that can't be touched by science. So I, I personally don't know a lot of theist skeptics, um, but I was, I was curious from your experience whether there's a version of belief in a deity that is typical of theist skeptics. Uh, are they, do they tend to be deists like Martin Gardner? Do they tend to defend their belief with the idea that there actually is evidence for a god? Or do they simply say, I'm going to withhold my skepticism in this domain for whatever reason, because it, it gives me comfort or, or because uh, they believe that uh, claims that can't be tested are open to believing whatever you want? Well, I know that uh, my dear departed friend, Martin Gardner, how I cherish his memory, he told me uh, it, face to face, he simply said, Randy, you have really good arguments for what you preach, what you say, what you believe in, and what you talk on. Excellent arguments. I can't counter those arguments. I have no good arguments for being a deist, but it simply makes me much more comfortable. And uh, again, I repeat, and as DJ has already told you, uh, I have to accept that because he was such a dear person and he contributed so much to us and to society, to the whole world. He's been translated in so many languages all across the globe. Such a valuable man. I have, to, I have to almost hesitate in thinking that maybe he was wrong, but I'm afraid he was wrong. I, I believe that he was wrong. Now, I will never soft pedal my atheism, and I include all religious claims as eligible for the prize, the million dollar prize, that the James Randi Educational Foundation offers. However, we need a very specific claim to test. The existence or non-existence of God is certainly not specific at all. But if you define God for me and say, because God does this, ah, there we've got a possibility we may be able to construct a protocol. And that's what we do. 
but we are not an atheist organization per se, except in the fact that most of us are atheists, certainly DJ and I are uh, confirmed atheists. So we want to try to make that clear. Please. At the same time, we have to make clear that as, as uh, skeptics, as, as rationalists, as, as scientists, people who believe in scientific method, that we're prepared to believe if the data indicate it. And I, I think we should also, also always make that clear because uh, uh, the last thing that uh, we can do is be dogma dogmatic about our non-belief. Uh, and in, in my, my book, God the Failed Hypothesis, I tried to point out several ways in which uh, some, someone could have won Randy's prize. Uh, in, in fact, there were three, three experimental groups uh, from uh, prestigious institutions, Harvard, Duke, and the Mayo Clinic that, 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 that were doing excellent, had done excellent uh, experiments on the efficacy of prayer. Uh, they all came out negative. These people, incidentally, were all, almost all believers. All the experimental, experimentalists were believers, as far as I could tell. But they were good scientists. They, they went where the data went, and the data did not support their, their, their belief. Obviously, they were hoping to, to demonstrate that, that uh, God existed by showing that prayer worked. But it could have. The point is, it could have. People who say that science has nothing to say about God are just wrong, because you can uh, uh, demonstrate that a, a God, at least a God, capital G God, I call it, the God that most people worship, not the deist God. The deist God is, is, is one that we uh, could never rule out. We have no reason to believe in a deist God, uh, and, but we, uh, uh, we can't rule that out. But the, the theist God, the God that uh, plays such an important role in the universe, uh, should have been detected by now, and, that, and that's, that's the the uh, statement that I, I tried to, to make, and that's, I think, a, the proper position that science would take. But we're ready to, ready to hear the evidence to the contrary. Okay. And I have to agree with Randy on something, that there, there are bad questions, questions that are so poor that uh, they, they don't even qualify as decent hypotheses. And, and you're right not to pursue them, you know, because until somebody defines what they mean by God and what they mean by exists, the question, does God exist, is nonsense. It, it gets you nowhere. Uh, but I would also add that I agree with DJ on, on, on the absence of evidence question. I mean, if you've got, if you've got something that's invisible and impalp impalpable, it's indistinguishable from something that's non-existent. So why should we accept that? that in addition to being able to do experiments and being able to observe and measure, another thing that a good scientist has to be able to do is clearly state where he got his information from. And if you're just daydreaming it out into existence, uh, that doesn't count. That's, that's not a good reason to believe in something. Uh, that, that's a reason to maybe wishful thinking is a reason to believe in it, but it, it's, it's not a good scientific or skeptical reason to accept something. Can I comment on this absence of evidence uh, issue? This is a statement that Carl Sagan was always famous for making. Absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. And you hear that all the time from, from theists. And I, I, th I think that uh, that's wrong, that absence of evidence can be evidence for absence and is evidence for absence, but there's evidence that should be there. Uh, and, and there are important cases. An, example, uh, an important example is now that we can show scientifically, pretty convincingly, that uh, the exodus did not happen as described in the Bible because uh, there is the absence of evidence in the Sinai Desert of the archaeological remains of people uh, camping out there for, for in large numbers at the particular time that that was supposed to happen. So here's a case of science actually showing uh, the, uh, that something didn't happen uh, by not by seeing direct evidence but seeing the absence of evidence. So, so the same thing I think is true for God again. It is, if, uh, the God that most people worship should answer prayers. That should be, uh, mill billions of prayers are said every day. Uh, you think one or two of them would have been answered in a, in a, in a testable way. Uh, God is supposed to uh, reveal truths to people. That's what's called revelation. That's very easy to test. Just have somebody come back from, with a revelation that, uh, 
that tells us something about the universe no one ever knew before, something about the world, some prediction of some future event. All of this is a uh, good scientific procedure, and uh, science ha has, has every capability of detecting the god most people worship. Oh, and, and just to defend Carl Sagan a little bit, I'm sure everybody here has read The Demon Haunted World. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> the story of the dragon in his garage. I mean, that's, that's a classic, beautiful story to explain uh, th this whole business of, of non-existent beings and, and what kinds of standards of evidence we should have. Yeah. And th remember, the dragon in his garage, since there was no good evidence nor any evidence that it existed, that was a perfectly legitimate reason to be skeptical of its existence. There are a lot of skeptics, even atheistic skeptics, who are maybe part of that same group of hand-wringers who... Um, scold everyone else for not doing it right, who say, uh, since you can't prove it one way or the other, it should be outside of the bounds of skepticism. Skeptics should not talk about their lack of belief in God because you can't prove the non-existence of that God, therefore you should withhold judgment. Um, I reject that. And in fact, Carl Sagan um, in Demon Haunted World, time and time again, expressed his skepticism of God. Uh, so I reject that things should be off limits just because you can't prove it one way or the other. I think the, the brute fact that you can't prove it one way or the other, that there's no evidence one way or the other, is a perfectly fine reason to be skeptical of a claim. But is it a reason that, you, that skepticism commits you to disbelieving, or is it just open to whatever you want? I think that if you consistently apply skepticism broadly and nothing's off limits, it will uh, necessarily overturn basic beliefs. And if part of that application of skepticism is uh, l only believing those things for which there's good evidence, you won't believe those things for which there's bad evidence or those things for which there's no evidence. So the answer is yes. I believe, to answer the question that hasn't yet been asked, that skepticism implies atheism uh, uh, kind of philosophically, even if not in practice, because we know many great skeptics who aren't atheists. It, just like I know some skeptics who are skeptical of this group of things over here, but they might also not be a skeptic of UFOs or some other paranormal or supernatural claim. So all that means is that people don't consistently apply their skepticism. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it, it does not demand neutrality from skeptics, that what skeptics can do in the absence of good reason, in the absence of good evidence, they should reject a hypothesis. If I say that right now I see beautiful invisible blue fairies flitting about in the room above you. You're all looking, right? Look up, there they are. Uh, you're gonna look and you're not gonna see them and you're going to ask, what reason do I have to say this? What, what kind of evidence can I provide that these actually exist and that somehow my eyes are special or whatever? And, and I think it would be fair for you all to say at this point that no, there are no invisible blue fairies, at least none in this room. And well, that- At least that there's no evidence. Therefore, you shouldn't believe it. There's no evidence, and therefore, you should reject the hypothesis until the guy promoting the hypothesis can provide something a little bit more convincing than his say so. So, it, it sounds like you all do agree that skepticism implies atheism. Defining skepticism broadly enough to include certain basic philosophical commitments like your default position in the absence of any evidence should be lack of belief even if a claim can't be empirically tested? Uh, Shivy, for one second, I just wanted to clear one thing up. I'm an atheist of the second kind. I want to make that clear. And I want to tell you what I mean by that. Webster's Dictionary has two definitions, the edition that I have, two definitions of atheist. The first one is one who denies the existence of a deity. Second one is one who denies there is enough evidence for a deity to be convincing. I'm one of the second kind because I cannot prove a negative. I can't prove that there are no orange storks or unicorns in South Africa, for example. I don't have the means to do it, and I can't do it anyway. I'd have to spend the rest of, of eternity searching all of South Africa to see if there was one there. You cannot prove negatives of that kind. 
I just wanted to, to make that clear in, in passing. And what were you at, young lady? I'm well, sorry. Well, b before we move on to the question, Randy, uh, elaborate on that point, because I think some people, if they haven't misunderstood your position, at least uh, I wonder if you're not being mischaracterized when people say, oh, Randy believes that you should not uh, be a skeptic of God uh, if there's no evidence one way or the other. Well, it, can, it, depend, it depends on your definition of God, too. God can do A. He can do a certain task. He can uh, cause something to happen if he wills it, he or she or it or whatever, wills it. And uh, if they say that, I say, how can we test it? If you can devise a test for that, like prayer or some such thing, fine. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you, in passing, my, uh, my cardiac surgeon's um, comment on one of my latest visits to him. I did have a double bypass, and that's an experience that sticks in your memory, I can assure you, uh, to say the least. And uh, he said to me, and casually while we're, while we're talking, he said, by the way, I guess at your business you get a lot of inquiries about this intelligent design question. I said, oh, do I ever? He said, well, uh, face them up with this. Your cardiac surgeon told you that he went into your left leg, opened it up, took out some veins, a couple of redundant veins in your leg that you don't really need at all. You don't use them. They're redundant. And he opened up your chest. And I don't want to get into all the details of that. I wasn't awake for it anyway, so I can't really <laughs> aver to it. But he replaced a couple of, uh, of, of arteries actually going into your heart very important ones, you need them, and they weren't working, they were clogged up. So I snipped them out, and I put in the veins from your leg. Now the leg doesn't suffer from that at all, I have no problem with the leg. He said, you won't have any problem because the veins are redundant. But in the human heart, there is not one scrap of tissue there that is redundant at all. If any scrap of tissue in the human heart fails, you die. And he added, of course, unless I'm there to save you, you see, he was trying to <laughs> keep me on the schedule. But that, that is absolutely true. There is nothing redundant about the human heart. And he went on to say, there are some rather primitive forms of life that have and had in the past two hearts, as if one was redundant, just in case one should fail, you'll go ahead. Now, is this intelligent design? No, not really, not in human beings anyway. Maybe we're the only species that's not intelligently designed. I asked them to think about that. So we've, we've been discussing the question of skepticism leading to atheism in, in the uh, sense of does it imply atheism, but I, I'm also interested in the empirical question of whether it actually results in atheism uh, in people who practice skeptical thinking. And so clearly, it's not uh, universally true in the sense that there are people who are good at skepticism who also hold some form of belief in a, a deity. Um, but I was wondering if you think that it's possible for people to completely compartmentalize and withhold their skepticism in this one domain, but be just as good of a skeptic in every other domain. Oh, I, I think it's very possible that they can withhold uh, making that decision not only because they want it to be true that there is a God, they need it to be true. It's a different verb altogether. They absolutely need it, they depend upon it, and they would feel totally in, in disasterville if they had to decide, gee, maybe there isn't any God. Some of them would be suicides, I'm sure of it, because they think entirely of Valhalla or Paradise or whatever they're going to, or whatever they believe they're going to, and they think about it constantly it's up ahead. My grandmother, my dear departed grandmother on my father's side, had a big purple dress in a drawer. And as a kid, I discovered it, and I said, Grandma, what's this for? She said, oh, that and the gold necklace there, I'm going to wear them in the coffin and in my funeral when I die. And I said, oh, well, uh, are you sure that uh, you'll be able to wear it? And she said, oh, well, of course, God will see to it. Well, when she died, we gave away the dress because she was far too big for it. And it didn't work out that way, you see. So that's also a lack of intelligent design, I would say, <laughs> but on somebody else's part. But this, this, this athe atheism thing to me, uh, I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, is very, very important. But the organization that I represent, the James Randi Educational Foundation, is not per se an atheist organization. 
and the only kind of thing we'll come up against and, and we will speak against in, in relation to atheism, that is non-belief in God, is when somebody offers us a specific case that we can test and the million dollars is there and it's up for grabs. So come to us with a, I'm not speaking to this audience, I'm speaking to an audience outside someplace there, <laughs> the rest of the world perhaps. But if you can design a test for a specific claim that would prove the existence or non-existence of God, bring it on. That's all you can say. S speaking for the JREF and to elaborate on that point, that's because the JREF's mission is focused, not because the JREF says such claims are outside the bounds of skepticism. And that point really needs to be emphasized because some people say, well, the JREF uh, says religious claims should be off limits to skepticism, and that in no sense is what we're saying. Randy talked about being the second kind of atheist, the atheist that lacks belief in God, not the atheist that has belief that there is no God. And those are, that's an old kind of, in atheist circles, that's an old distinction, but it's an important one to make. I know probably only two atheists who say, I know God doesn't exist. Every other atheist I've ever met, including Dawkins and others, says, I, I lack belief in God because there's so little evidence. I think that God is highly unlikely because there's so little evidence. But only the caricature of atheists from the cultural competitors is the atheist that says, I know God doesn't exist. So if people are able to completely, I'm sorry, please. I keep hearing this over and over again I, uh, from the panel, namely that uh, they don't believe because there is no evidence. And I claim that more than that that we can say, I claim that there is evidence against the existence of a God that plays an important role in the universe. More than just not believing because there's no evidence. So, sorry. so if, if someone's able to completely compartmentalize and withhold their skepticism in one area and still be a perfect skeptic in all the other areas, what, what is the justification for challenging them on, on that one area, for challenging their, their theism? Or do you think that we shouldn't challenge them on their theism? No, we, sh we should challenge them. That, uh, you cannot reserve your beliefs and accept them from all criticism. That that's got to be an important part of the, of the skeptical commu community. But on the other hand, uh, every single person here, somewhere lurking in their brain, is holding an irrational thought. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that you fervently believe that you cannot test. And so we should not have a witch hunt where we go through and grill everyone and say, well, if you, if you don't follow the dogma of true skepticism, we're going to throw you out of this group uh, because we'd all be leaving right now. So that's not going to happen. Uh, but at the same time, if you mention some belief like, oh, I believe in Jesus or I believe in invisible blue fairies or whatever, uh, it's fair ground. We can, we can tackle that one. We can argue about it. And, and I think it's also fair to say that many of these beliefs will be considered absolutely ridiculous and should be rejected out of hand. But we won't throw you out for it. You know, the, um, there's been a lot of work done, and I don't claim to be an expert in this area, on the evolution of, of religion. And it seems to be coming down, if I could oversimplify, uh, is that we have a tendency to, uh, to assume agency where no agency exists. And this once had survival value. If you can imagine the caveman walking through the woods and see some rustling of leaves, it's, it's uh, just, just a rustling of just a natural phenomenon. But uh, if he didn't react to that and, and take defensive action in case it was a tiger, well, those genes would have died out, you see. So we have built into our genes from 10,000 years ago or more, uh, this, this uh, built into our brain, this module that, uh, that uh, over, over sensitive, is oversensitive. And other, incidentally, other animals have it as well. Even a clam has this oversensitivity. So this has given us a tendency to put agency, uh, give animate agency to phenomena that uh, are purely natural. And we still have it. The trouble is, we no longer need it. We, uh, and, and the only thing, so we're stuck with this module in our brain, and the only th way we can break out of it is by our own intelligence, our own uh, 
taking taking our our brains into our own hands, let's say, and to and to not let that rule our thinking. Well, let so, me disagree a little bit. So I, I, I suspect that something like a theory of mind is a prerequisite to consciousness. And, and so this ability to empathize and to uh, impose a hypothetical agency on the world is an important part of how our brains work. And so, no, I, I don't think it's obsolete. I think it's absolutely essential. But it, at the same time, we've got to have a, a conscious intellectual appreciation of the fact that a, you know, a, a twig scraping across the window is not L's pounding at the door, okay? And so, I, 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 think it, I think it's essential, but it's, it's, it's got to be limited by rational thought. Right, to go back to Vic's caveman for a moment, uh, I've often said that uh, I, I can picture a caveman of whatever particular species um, suddenly finding water falling on him out of the sky in an area where he doesn't normally experience what we now know as rain. What would he do? He would, I think, come up with the idea, oh, there must be an agency, a god, and it can easily then generate uh, or get the, the status of a god. There must be a rain god. Oh, thunder. I've never heard that before. There must be a thunder god, too. Maybe they're the same one. I have to work on that. He starts to develop theories like this. And, well, as we know, there are so many gods in primitive situ situations. There was a, a, a god for hangnail, I'm sure, someplace along the line. <laughs> And uh, you had to, to appease that god or the hangnail wouldn't go away properly. But it, it is, it's a natural thing. This agency thing that, uh, that you came up with, Vic, I, I admire that greatly. I, I think that's a very strong point that we should make when we're making our arguments. So it's a little hard for me to find any, anything to actually disagree with you guys about on, on the principles. Uh, but, but I'm going to try. Uh, so there's, there's two kinds of rationality that I, I like to to think of. There's, there's epistemic rationality in which you're really striving to understand the truth about the world, and then there's instrumental rationality in which you're trying to maximize your self-interest, in ho however sense you want to define that. So is it really, can we really say that it's irrational and deserving of challenge if someone decides that, not that they're going to try to make a case for, uh, for theism, but that they're just going to not examine that belief of theirs and just not subject it to skeptical inquiry. So it's not that they're, they're performing skeptical inquiry poorly, they're just deciding to exempt a belief of theirs. Is that still, PZ, would you, would you still say that that's something worth challenging? Well, yes, because you know, there's this general principle is, is that we think it's good for our brains, good exercise for our minds to actually think about things. And so in that sense, yeah, I would say, you know, we all, we all have these beliefs that may make us feel better. You know, like, like, like many religious people consider the belief in an afterlife to be instrumentally useful in, you know, consoling them to their existence and, and, and reconciling them to death and so forth. Uh, does that mean we shouldn't question that? And I, I think we should. That, that believing in a falsehood is a kind of false comfort and if we have a deep appreciation of the, of the truth, we want to bring that up. So, uh, tactically speaking, I know that a lot of people feel that it's bad for the movement, for the skeptic movement to associate officially, publicly, with the atheist movement. Mm -hmm. Either that it will alienate people who otherwise would have joined the skeptic movement and who are enthusiastic about uh, skeptically investigating c claims of the paranormal or, or, or pseudoscience, or that uh, being identified publicly as atheists, uh, as an atheist movement, will make it harder to get other people to listen to us when, when we're challenging claims of paranormal and of pseudoscience. So I'm wondering if that is a good enough argument for not making this case officially. It's been argued uh, a number of times by a number of folks that I'm close to in this little movement mm -hmm. that the um, blurring of the lines between atheism and skepticism will kill skepticism. Mm -hmm. um, I reject that, but um, I do want to say that atheism is not skepticism entirely. It's only skepticism about one supernatural claim. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, atheism is not enough. I would much rather be around someone who believes in some weak kind of deist God who's 
going to consistently apply skepticism in other areas of his or her life than a numbskull atheist who uh, doesn't appreciate testing claims in general. Um, so atheism is not enough. That's the point I want to make. Uh, further uh, to your question, uh, it's, I think, a, a undue, hand, uh, undue hand wringing by folks who say, uh, f only for strategic reasons or for fundraising reasons in 30 years, this has been an argument, we should soft pedal the atheism, not talk about the atheism. Indeed, there are religious supporters of PSYCOP, and so there was always a kind of non-overlapping magisterium, the history of the organized skepticism movement, where one organization did skepticism of religion, another organization did skepticism of the paranormal and pseudoscience, and consequently you had nuns, N-U-N-S, not N-O-N-E-S, who supported PSYCOP, but would never touch the Council for Secular Humanism because they were comfortable with skepticism of all kinds of beliefs except their God belief. And that seemed to be a kind of cunning strategy that may have worked, and I'm not, I wouldn't contend that everyone in that organization adopted that strategy, but I've been in meetings where those arguments were made. That is not the JREF's position. Oh, uh, uh, don't touch on religion just because it will hurt our fundraising. In fact, I think if we pushed re uh, uh, skepticism of religion, we'd probably get more atheists uh, supporting the JREF. We have a principled position that Organizations are best if they have a limited mission and just don't try to do everything. It's just nonprofit business management. It's a corporate strategy that there are other organizations that deal with atheism. We want to deal with testable pseudoscience um, and paranormal claims. And uh, I spent four hours with Randy uh, on the ride from St. Louis today, and uh, he rather persuasively, I wouldn't say convinced me, because I probably already ha had the view before, um, but he rather persuasively said, look, atheism is skepticism of one kind of belief. It's, I would disagree with you, that it's a philosophical commitment. I think, no, it's just a lack of belief based on lack of evidence. That's all atheism is. Yes, but while I agree that it's one, atheism is one form of skepticism, I would say it's so overwhelmingly the most important form that uh, by emphasizing it, even if we lose a few members here and there, we're going to gain a lot more. And, be, and the reason is that we just have to fight religion. Religion is an unhealthy part of society. It, it's unhealthy for the individual. Thank you. It, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy for, for society. And uh, incidentally, I remember when skeptical inquirer always avoided religion, and then they put out a, an issue on science and religion and it was their best-selling issue. And every time they've put out a, a, one on science and religion, it's been, it's been a, big, a big seller. So certainly, within the skeptical movement, even if you don't want to take a hard stand for atheism, you still have the whole science and religion issue, whether or not science and religion are, are incompatible. I think they are, and, and I think uh, uh, I'm going to, I promise you I'll keep uh, pressing that point. Yeah, and I, I have to say I, I I resent an unconscious assumption of the question that I've heard several times tonight, and that is that atheism is some kind of poisonous baggage that comes along, that, that we have to you know, throw up our hands in horror at the thought that atheists might be lurking in our organization and that it's, it's going to damage everything. And, and, and I think that's wrong. I mean, if, for instance, we, we said, well, you know, there's a lot of people with those dirty, filthy beards in this organization, <laughs> and they seem to be drawn to this, what can we do to diso disassociate ourselves from those grubby, hippie-like creatures? <laughs> That's how I feel when, we, when we're talking about atheism here. That, you know, it's, it's like this is, the, there, there's this assumption that atheism is something criminally bad or horrible in some faint way. Uh, and, it's, and it's not. And one of the things we have to do is get over this assumption. Well, I, I think the assumption was that it I was unpopular. I didn't mean unpopular. personally. Yes, I know. But, I know. <laughs> right. But it, it sounds that way. And I'm not shaving and I'm not giving up atheism. And you know. <laughs> so, I'm sorry? Uh, so, continuing with the tactical... Um, interpretation of the question of skepticism leading to atheism, do you think that, 
convincing people to think skeptically about Wu is going to make them more likely to question their religious beliefs? And also, does it work the other way too? If you, if you challenge someone on their religious beliefs, are they going to think more skeptically in other areas too? Does it carry over? I've had it work that way. Uh, I've, uh, twice now I've run into young ladies in, in various professions in different parts of the world, I couldn't name them right now, but who came to me and told me that they had taken on a skeptical attitude about everything except religion, and they had a very difficult time fending off the, the skeptics who would say, but aren't you skeptical about religion? But um, one of them actually said that she got a copy of Flim Flam. I, I believe that was in Finland, as a matter of fact, as I recollect now, and she, and they're so multilingual in Finland, they had no trouble making it through my prose, apparently. And she read it, she said, from cover to cover, and then she turned back to the first page and she read it all over again and closed it with the conviction that she had been quite wrong, even though Flim Flam does not handle religion per se, that she was convinced that she should have taken religion into uh, consideration when she got skeptical. And so that happened in that particular case and another case very similar to it in another country. So I've had that happen where people get skeptical and eventually will drop their their belief in religion when they really study the skeptical movement and what it means and what it really intends to get across. So that could be an argument for not being public about the atheism if, if that's how we can get to that point anyway by that roundabout route. If it were the secret agenda of skeptics organizations or skeptics in general to, again, secretly advance atheism, mm -hmm. Um, they might want to push skepticism of goofy claims that don't touch on religion as a kind of gateway drug, right? Uh, that gets them eventually to be an atheist. But I reject that that's a secret agenda. I don't think people are organized as skeptics in order to secretly push atheism. Uh, the majority of skeptics are atheists, but uh, I think the larger issue is pushing skepticism consistently applied and broadly, and it's not doctrinaire. It's not, you must be a skeptic of this claim, that claim, and the other claim in order to be in our midst. It is an emphasis both on method and on content. It's not just one or the other. We have 10 minutes left, and so I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, if there are any people who had questions left over from the previous panel who didn't get to ask them, um, now's your chance. Now you guys don't have a mic. Check, check. All right, well, thanks for you all coming here. This has been real awesome hearing you all, some of my heroes. But um, well, getting back to a comment that was made before, uh, it seems like the term atheism is almost, or atheist, uh, is being viewed as a you know, pejorative or a negative. And I don't think that's the case. I think we have to claim that and you know, show the positive aspects of atheism. And how do we do that? Uh, let's start with Victor. Oh. Yeah, we have, we have to uh, pro probably take on a lot of the trappings of, of religion, none of the supernaturalism, of course. But, but there's also the social aspect that's very important to so many people. Uh, uh, that go to church for that reason. We have to have more of that. Uh, one of the things I admire about the the young people's groups that are uh, pro cropping up uh, at a rapid uh, rate uh, on campus, thanks to the secular uh, the secular student alliance, they've had 80 groups back uh, three years ago, and now they've got well over 230 or something like that. And and these groups uh, do socialize. Uh, the skeptics in the pub type of a thing is, is great. Uh, so we have to do that. But also I think we have, we, we might even consider uh, uh, not uh, encouraging religious people who are non-believers. Believe it or not, there are such people like Jews. A lot of, a lot, a lot of Jews in America don't believe in God, but they still uh, respect their heritage and, and still participate in various rituals. And I don't think we, we want to discourage that. This is what goes on, incidentally, in, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries where, where belief in 
in, in God is, is very low, but uh, they still pay their 1% one, one, uh, uh, tax a year uh, to the state churches because they still want the church to, for uh, uh, weddings and, and funerals and other activities. So, and, and again, a part of the, the nation's heritage. So I don't think we want to discourage any of that. We want to make that uh, uh, more common. All right, this question's for Randy. Um, you had said a little bit ago that um, many people have a need for religion and that if they somehow lost that, this would put them at the risk of possible suicides. And if that's the case, then shouldn't we have some sort of moral obligation to prevent them from having that need in the first place? In other words, not tell them? Uh, <laughs> let them find out when they die, nothing here, what, what happened? <laughs> I think maybe that's the best way to do it. But it is true, it is true. I've known people, uh, I had an, an aunt, as a matter of fact, in my own family, believe it or not, who was absolutely floored uh, when she found out that I was an atheist and when I really spent three or four days talking her out of her religious beliefs and she was in tears, she was ready to, to just give up the ghost right there. That's not a right expression. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize for that. It was a slip, <laughs> slip of the brain. But uh, I've known people that uh, on several occasions during my very long life so far uh, that have shown they're, they're so desperate, they so much need, they don't just want, they so much need a belief in a deity and particularly an afterlife. The fact that they're gonna die and not exist anymore is pretty scary to them, so scary that they will often turn right around and just, and I've had them cut off relationships with me altogether because it was too damaging to them. Okay, I want to, I want to, give, I want to give a contrary example also, also from, from my own uh, upbringing as, as a Catholic. Uh, I was, I, I'm old enough uh, to have been a child when, when childhood death was still quite common. I, I had a, a, at least two cousins die in childhood. Uh, I had a playmate die of polio. And uh, all these families were Catholics. And they all believed for the rest of their lives that, that God was punishing them. That punished them for, for some sins they had committed. They didn't know what the sins were, but they, they still believed that uh, God pun was punishing them. And their priests were very sympathetic, really tried to tell them, no, 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 it's just as God's, God's will, you know, and uh, you had nothing to do with it, it wasn't your fault, but they never believed it. And uh, they lived the rest of their lives uh, in, in, uh, in, with that terrible thought uh, clinging to them constantly that uh, they, they lost a child because of their own fault. If they had been atheists, they would have grieved but got over it. And that, I think that's a good example of, of, of what I was saying about religion. Religion is, is unhealthy for the individual. Just quickly on this point, because I think it's so important, substitute God in that question for belief in ghosts. There are folks who believe in ghosts, and if you share with them your skepticism of ghosts, they may cry, they may be deeply upset, but we should never say that that ghost belief should be immune to criticism. Yes, we're nice people, so we don't go to someone on his or her deathbed and say, guess what, when you die, it's oblivion buster. Um, but on the other hand, if you're engaging with someone, you shouldn't pussyfoot around these central beliefs just because it might be upsetting. And uh, I'm speaking there as an individual, not uh, for the organization, because of course the organization does have a limited scope. Uh, and let me also add, that I agree with Randy that there are a lot of people who need this stuff, but ask why do they need it? And it's because priestly child abusers have spoon-fed propaganda into their brains from birth. Yeah. Get rid of that and we no longer have this kind of crippling addiction on these metaphysical ideas. Um, my question is for Randy and DJ, but I want to uh, Dr. Stinger and PZ to feel free to chime in here too. Um, I think I might have picked up on a difference um, among the panelists. I think Randy and DJ are on the same page in wanting to soft pedal atheism a little bit more 
than Victor and PZ. PZ had the example of the, the blue fairies that are invisible and uh, impalpable and um, you know, would you, would you believe that they're really here in the auditorium? And of course, none of us would. And uh, Victor said, I think in response to something that, that Randy said, I would want to go farther than that and say there's, there's positive evidence against the existence of God. So this, uh, Randy, I'll put the, the question in, in terms of your um, cap, uh, excuse me, um, atheist in the second sense, right? Um, why, why not also be an atheist in the first sense? First of all, and, and so here I'll, I'll pick up on something that DJ said, um, even the most um, avowed atheist, uh, sort of so-called militant atheist, I think that's an unfair label, but somebody like Richard Dawkins says, um, you know, I just think it's highly unlikely that God doesn't exist. But why isn't, why do we have to qualify the atheism there? I mean, we, we don't say to be a theist, you have to be absolutely certain that God exists, and very few theists claim that, right? Um, so, so why, why soft pedal um, the atheism? And then with, I mean, just as an epistemological point, um, what, I'm sorry, um, PZ was saying about doubting the, the blue fairies, right? Even, even Christians doubt, completely doubt the existence of Thor and Zeus and so on. We don't say um, you can't be a complete atheist about them. So, so why the qualified atheism from DJ and Randy? All right, I want to make a statement here. I cannot prove that there is no deity. However, I firmly believe that there is no jealous, capricious, angry, vengeful, insecure, cruel, murderous critter known as the deity. And I want you to notice that I said critter, I didn't say creature, because that would involve the possibility it even God was created by another God. I, I don't allow any possibilities here. That is my firm belief, but I cannot prove it because there is no way for me to prove that. I cannot prove that kind of a negative. I can prove one negative, that I am not a giraffe because I'm much more attractive and my neck isn't quite as long. I, uh, to follow up uh, on the question, Vic, because he asked uh, also me, um, I am not certain that God does not exist. And I think most of us are not certain that God does not exist. Those of us at a pub gathering who says, I know that God does not exist, well, that merits a great long discussion about epistemology. You know, you can't, as Randy said, he's talking about the second kind of atheist. Well, we're all that kind of atheist. The first kind is very rare if it even exists at all. The first kind is a caricature. It's about a knowledge claim. I lack belief in God because there's no good evidence. I don't have belief that there is no God because there's good evidence that there isn't. Vic and Dawkins and others have lately been arguing that there's positive evidence for God's non-existence. And I think that is an important avenue to explore. And I don't reject those uh, kind of positive claims out of hand. But I don't think you need positive evidence to legitimately be an atheist. You just need lack of good evidence or lack of evidence in general. I reject that it's soft-peddling atheism to say I lack belief in God because there's no reason to believe in God. I, 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 in fact, I think that's hard-peddling atheism. I don't know. It's, it's avowed and out and loud and proud, and I don't think you need to uh, do anything more than that. Well, I think this type 1 atheism was misdefined because I don't think anybody knows, right? Nobody knows. And certainly as a scientist, I, and I've, I've tried to make it very clear, I'm, I'm willing to accept evidence to the, uh, to the uh, contrary. Uh, and it's a matter of, of, of what you mean by proof. I hate to get into definitions again, but uh, the way a scientist uses proof when he's not doing a logical analysis, he or she, doing a logical analysis or a mathematical analysis, which does involve logical proof, they're, they're using proof in the way uh, it's sometimes it's used in a, in a criminal court, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so when I say I can prove God does not exist, first of all, I mean the Judeo-Christian Islamic God or God such as, as him, who, or as he, who, such as him, or he, whatever, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, who, 
plays such an important role in the universe that it, it should have been detected by now. But it's possible, again, that uh, that's wrong. And we have to allow s some possibility uh, that I'm wrong on that. But it's a very, I just claim it's a very low probability. It's a probability that's so low that I can live my life uh, without uh, counting on it. Hell, I'll even believe in spoon bending if I can get some evidence. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Well, I've, I've got to say something. First of all, I'm, I'm deeply offended by your rejection of my invisible blue fairies. <laughs> and I may have to storm out of Skepticon in a snit and damn j Rep all to hell. But um, the other thing is I, 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 I agree with what's been said so far and I think there's, I, I, I don't think there's a substantial difference between us on, on this issue. And I, I agree that the j Rep should not focus on atheism for the same reason that organizations like Quack watch don't. You know, they've got a mission. And it's perfectly acceptable to say there's a huge complicated world out there with a lot of crazy beliefs out there and my organization focuses on X, Y, and Z and we'll let the other organizations take care of A, B, and C. Okay, this will be the last question, guys. So uh, this is uh, kind of related to the previous one, but I think the uh, type one versus type two kind of hinges uh, on what you mean by God. I'm like, this might be true of uh, the weak deist uh, God, but uh, a benevolent, omnipotent being, as God is more typically defined, um, I'll be an atheist that says, I know there is not a God. Like Randy just said. No. Well, you know, there is logical, there is a whole set of logical proofs against the existence of God. You can prove logically that God does not exist when you define the attributes uh, of the God you're talking about. And so the, the, uh, the, th the three O God, the omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnibenevolent God could pretty well be logically disproved. Uh, although, of course, you'll find, you'll find theologians who, who claim that's not true. I think uh, it's, it's uh, pretty convincing. And, you know, there's a, there is a whole society called the uh, Disproof Atheism Society in, in Boston that holds regular meetings and, uh, and where philosophers come and give their proofs of the non-existence of God. And they always define what God they're talking about. And, the, and the, uh, uh, there's two books out. Well, there's one book called The, uh, the Impossibility of God that lists a lot of those, uh, of those papers. So that can be done.